Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Connecticut's Old State House on this beautiful summer day. We applaud you all for coming inside because it's so beautiful outside. Of course, after the presentation today, you're free to go outside into our farmer's market where we have all kinds of delicious foods and wonderful plants and things for you to look at and enjoy. And this is the launch of our farmer's market today, which will take place twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays through October. So you, are, um, you have an opportunity to go out and, and enjoy what's outside later. But right now, we have a wonderful, wonderful um, presentation and conversation for you today as part of our noontime lectures that we do once a month, thanks to funding from Connecticut Humanities. Um, we, we appreciate their support in these programs. It enables to bring us to bring you all kinds of conversations of things about things of importance in Connecticut. So um, welcome for that today. I would like to introduce Diane Smith, um, CTN Senior Producer for Program Development. As you know, if you've been to our program, she moderates and she asks wonderful questions and invites you to join in with the questions as well. So um, welcome to Diane and thank you all for being here. Nothing like putting pressure on, Sandy. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. Okay. Well, I'm really glad that all of you are here. Um, Don Williams, as many of you may know, is the longest serving Senate president pro tempore in state history. He served in the position for 10 years, but he surprised his Democratic caucus in February by announcing he was not going to run for reelection. Senator Williams, in his time in the Senate, has been at the center of some of the biggest issues of our times, ranging from gun control to abolishing the death penalty to supporting education, notably at the state college campuses. Senator Williams has worked with the past three governors and the past four House speakers. And I loved this Hartford Current editorial, which was titled, Hats off to Don Williams' able leadership. And the paper noted that, unlike many of his counterparts at the federal level on both sides of the aisle, he is not a partisan brawler by nature. He's a doer. He's direct and inclusive. He is courageous. He is capable of seeking compromise. Those are values to be cherished. In his spare time, Don Williams has been working on a book about Prudence Crandall not only on her own remarkable history as a woman who decided to break color barriers and educate young women of color, but he has really brilliantly intertwined the story of her life with how her legacy influenced the civil rights movement and very important cases ranging from Dred Scott to Brown versus Board of Education, things that I had never really made the connection with before. So I'd like you all to welcome Senator Don Williams. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. Uh, thank you all for being here. And I want to give a special thank you to the Old State House and its staff for sponsoring this and the entire series of lectures and discussions here. And it's very appropriate that we're here at the Old State House because this building uh, played a role in Prudence Crandall's story and legacy. And we'll get to that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but I want to talk to you today about our state heroine, Prudence Crandall. And maybe some of you know something about her story. And if you do, it's probably that she ran a school for black women in the 1830s. Uh, there was a good deal of controversy about that. Uh, and it was closed in a, an act of violence uh, where the community literally rose up uh, at midnight uh, and vandalized the school to the point where Prudence and her supporters felt that they could no longer uh, continue. And sometimes that's where the story ends. Uh, but I want to talk today about her story, what she did, uh, but also her lasting legacy that touches our history and our lives uh, today. This discussion is a discussion about uh, the ongoing fight uh, for equality, uh, and particularly in her time, but also today, uh, the ongoing fight for equality for not only minorities and those of different colors and beliefs, but for women as well. So first of all, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, Prudence Crandall. She was born in Rhode Island 
in the town of Carpenters Falls. It was named Carpenters Falls after her grandmother, or her grandfather on her mother's side, Hezekiah Carpenter. And he established a whole series of mills, uh, was fairly prosperous, uh, and Prudence grew up in a fairly prosperous uh, family. Uh, her father, Pardon, and her mother, Esther, moved from Rhode Island to Canterbury uh, when she was 10 years old. Uh, they had a farm. Uh, Hezekiah uh, had left her father, Pardon, uh, a fairly generous inheritance. Uh, so the family was able to survive uh, quite well on the earnings uh, from farming, but also on the inheritance. Uh, Prudence was raised as a Quaker in the Quaker faith. Uh, and the Quakers believed in equality. They also believed that slavery was a sin. And growing up in the beginning of the 1800s uh, was a difficult time for those who believed in equality and who opposed slavery. Slavery was an incredible and terrible conflicting issue in America. Now, here we were as a country born in revolution for the purpose of freedom with a declaration of independence that talked about equality for all. All men are created equal and entitled to the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. That was the founding principle of our country. At different times, the founding fathers said that slavery should end. They understood that it was an abomination in a country founded on a revolution to provide freedom. And yet, virtually every founding father owned slaves. John Adams was one of the few who did not own slaves because he adamantly opposed slavery. So here we were as a young nation with this incredible paradox, lifting ourselves up as a land of liberty and freedom and equality, and in our midst, human bondage, slavery. And the economy of the South was dependent upon slavery, as we know, but the economy of the North also benefited greatly from slavery. Northern sailors, and merchants were involved in the slave trade, and northern businessmen profited from the materials and raw materials produced by the South by slave labor. So, in the 1820s and 1830s, a movement began called the Abolitionist Movement. And this was made up of folks who were, like Prudence Crandall's family, uh, opposed to slavery. And they wanted to change America so that it would live up to the Declaration of Independence. So as Prudence Crandall grew up, her father, Pardon, wanted to make sure that all of his sons and daughters, he had two sons and two daughters, had an education. This was pretty progressive thinking. Prudence Crandall went to a Quaker school in the nearby town of Plainfield, Connecticut. That Quaker school was run by an abolitionist who later wrote an article for an abolitionist newspaper in Boston, The Liberator, talking about how black children deserved an education. So that was his philosophy. Prudence Crandall attended a Quaker school run by this gentleman. And her parents later sent her to the Friends School in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, today uh, named after its founder, Moses Brown. Uh, and Moses Brown was still alive at the time that, he was in his late 80s, at the time that Prudence attended that school. And he was a Quaker, and he was an abolitionist, and he was part of the Underground Railroad. And he truly believed in progressive education for everyone, men and women. And Prudence was immersed in an atmosphere with students from all over New England. And uh, the ideas that they were able to talk about, the teachers who cared about the education of men and women, this made a significant impression upon her. She decided she wanted to become a teacher. So when, after four years at the Friends School, uh, she came back to Connecticut. Uh, she taught school in Lisbon. She taught school in Plainfield. And then in 1831, the town of Canterbury was interested in having an academy for young women, not just a finishing school, but a school where young women could get an education in English, in science, 
in foreign languages, in the arts, and Prudence Crandall uh, began that school. And her school was not only embraced by the community uh, of Canterbury, but also students from some of the surrounding towns came as well. And the town fathers were very pleased because they felt that this would help elevate the town of, of Canterbury within Wyndham County. And also, well, the parents of all the students, especially those from outside town, would be introduced uh, to the local shops and businesses of Canterbury. So it was a win-win for, for everyone. Now, as Prudence Crandall ran her school, she employed servants, or those that she referred to as family assistants. And one of those was uh, Mariah Davis, a young black woman, uh, who was also friends with the Harris family in the town of Canterbury, because she was engaged uh, to be married to Charles Harris. Charles Harris's uh, sister was Sarah Harris. And Sarah Harris would visit uh, Mariah at the school and observe Mariah doing some of the chores, and also observe the fact that at the end of the day, when Mariah was done with her chores, she would often sit in on some of the classes. And Sarah Harris came from a, a family where her father was a farmer and actually earned a decent living and income for a black family living in Canterbury at the time. And her father, was the agent for a particular newspaper called The Liberator. The Liberator was an anti-slavery, abolitionist newspaper, uh, the most influential anti-slavery newspaper of its kind at the time. And it was published by William Lloyd Garrison in Boston. So Sarah Harris read The Liberator. Mariah Davis read The Liberator. And they brought copies to the school. And on one day, Prudence Crandall read The Liberator. And after that, she wanted to read every copy of The Liberator and other anti-slavery literature that the Harris family had. Now, in 1832, in, at the end of the summer, the beginning of the fall, Sarah Harris summoned the courage to ask Prudence Crandall if she could enroll as a student, not to sit in on classes at the end of the day on an informal basis, if she could be a student at Prudence Crandall's school. Prudence Crandall took that request in, and she also noticed that Sarah said in addition, you know, if, if this would in any way injure your school, I understand, and I won't press my request. Sarah had some idea of the magnitude of her request, and certainly Prudence Crandall did as well, a young black woman asking to be a student at a school that at this point was comprised only of young white women. Now, segregation was not required in the state of Connecticut. It was not a matter of law. But segregation in the North uh, was largely a matter of social custom at most, not all, but most events and within most institutions. It was an understanding. And as Prudence Crandall considered this decision, she also had to consider her own particular fortune in being the headmistress of this school. She had been embraced by the community. She had a role as a woman that few women in the United States had at that time. And the fact that she was single was actually an advantage to her. If she had been married at the time, she would not have been able to have conducted the business of running the school herself. She could not have owned real estate, could not have entered into contracts. That would have been the, the, the business of her husband. Now, at that time, women could not speak at public meetings. At town meetings, women would not be recognized. They were there to be seen, but not to be heard. There was a movement at the time that Prudence was a part of called the Temperance Movement to eradicate alcohol that was uh, damaging uh, communities in, in many different ways. And this was a movement largely propelled by women. But at, even at the temperance meetings, it was only the men who could speak. So this was the state of the lack of equality between men and women at the time. Prudence Crandall had to think about what this would do. Uh, her family was part of this school. They had 
invested their time and energy and resources. There was an outstanding mortgage that the family had entered into, that Prudence Crandall had entered into, of $1,500, which was a pretty large sum of money for that time. Uh, her sister, Almira, was employed at the school. There was a lot riding on this. And she certainly, because of the success of this school, had a pathway forward as a very successful woman in a way that women could rarely be that successful and be that on top of uh, the, the, the heap in terms of running a school. So she did not give Sarah Harris an answer. She said, I'll think about it. And days went by, weeks went by, and Prudence Crandall clearly was conflicted considering all of these different issues as to the practicality of things. On the one hand, the community expectations that she would not admit a black student. On the other hand, her conscience, her religious beliefs, what she had learned at the Quaker School in Plainfield and the Friends School in Providence. And in addition, she had a recent religious conversion. Prudence Crandall at this moment was no longer a practicing Quaker. There was something called the Second Great Awakening, which was an evangelical movement throughout the United States, especially in New England at this time. And it was an, event, an evangelical movement uh, that we have seen at other periods in our history. Uh, preachers uh, traveled the countryside holding informal revivals that lasted two and three and four days continuously with services in farm fields and not a lot of hocus pocus ceremony, uh, but emphatic and charismatic speeches that spoke directly to people. And the whole idea of the movement was that yes, we have our beliefs, including uh, the belief that slavery is wrong, but it's not enough to sit back meekly and wait for change to happen, you need to make that change happen and be a part of that change. And that was largely the message that Prudence Crandall heard uh, through this evangelical movement. And so she took the values that she had learned growing up as a Quaker and the values that she had learned in her education and now her newfound spiritual energy and considered Sarah's question. All that being the case, she did not go back to Sarah and say, yes, you can be my student. At the same time, she did not go back to Sarah and do what would have been expedient and say, you know what, uh, you can't be a student, or maybe I'll tutor, your, tutor you after hours. About a month later, Sarah came back and uh, pressed her request a second time. And when she asked Prudence Crandall the second time, uh, Prudence Crandall said, yes. You may, I, I understand that there may be issues uh, and if there are, I can bear it. Uh, you may be my student. Now, when Sarah Harris entered the school, interestingly, there was no adverse reaction from the students. And isn't that the way it is uh, oftentimes? The children were accepting. Some of them had seen Sarah in other contexts within the town of Canterbury at the Westminster a Congregational Church. And for a number of days, uh, life went on as usual within Prudence Crandall School. But once the parents found out about it, then controversy erupted. When the adults got involved, uh, they became very angry. The town fathers came to Prudence Crandall School. They uh, attempted to talk her out of this. They asked her to expel Sarah Harris. Prudence Crandall uh, refused. Uh, the town fathers came back and said, well, we will hold a town meeting to condemn your school, which they did, and at which Prudence Crandall could not defend herself or her school for the reasons that I spoke of a second ago. She did have a few allies at that point who then tried to make the case, uh, but were shouted down because they were not from the town of Canterbury and were not allowed to speak. Uh, but the vote of the town meeting had no force her effect on the school. She kept running her school. The parents uh, threatened to withdraw their daughters. Prudence Crandall, uh, at that point, had to decide whether to save her school and expel Sarah Harris or watch it go down. And it was a terrible choice. And in the midst of trying to make this horrendous decision, uh, Prudence hit upon a bold idea. 
And I, just, I think it's incredible when, when I, you're thinking of the 1830s and what she was going through, and rather than simply capitulate and take the easy path and say, you know what, Sarah, it's just not going to work out. And by the way, I, I got to think about this mortgage, my family, my future, my career, my sister who works here, the expectations of the town, and by the way, they've all been very supportive of me. Uh, instead, Prudence Crandall came up with an incredibly radical idea. She would dismiss the white students and convert her school to a school for black women only. I, I, it's still, it gives me shivers, really, when I think of it. How, how did she come to this conclusion? She knew she could not do it alone, and she reached out to William Lloyd Garrison, the publisher of The Liberator in Boston. She traveled uh, in January of 1833 to visit him. She laid out her plan. She said, look, I think your new newspaper can be a tool uh, to help attract students. I'm going to need to attract students from all over New England because I know that there are not enough black students in Canterbury or the immediate surrounding towns uh, to pay the tuition to support a school like this. Uh, but this is something that I want to do. Garrison was incredibly impressed. Uh, they went forward. Uh, Prudence Crandall went straight from Boston to Providence. And at the time, you have to remember, I mean, this, this was the time where to go from Can Canterbury to Boston, you got up at about 3 in the morning in total darkness, and you got on a stagecoach uh, that was horrendous in terms of the, the, the system of physical transportation if you're going to be in this for hours. And then you would get into Boston in the late evening. And so then, then she went from Boston to Providence because Garrison had given her the names of black families that she could contact and see if she could uh, enroll some students. And then she got back to Canterbury and she had talked to Garrison about New York City. What about visiting black ministers in New York City? And Garrison then sent her some names. And five days after she got back from Canterbury, after going to Boston and Providence, Prudence Crandall was back on the road going to New York City, meeting with black ministers. Again, enrolling additional black students so that she could begin her school on April 1st, 1833. Uh, if you think about the time and effort that was involved, and this, this was a woman doing things that women were not expected to do, and most people would have been shocked at the fact that Prudence Crandall was able to do this. Uh, she was able to get enough folks at the time that she thought would uh, sustain her school. Her school opened in April, the actual students arriving came slowly. She had to make some additional appeals. She had to make some additional trips, including going to, back to New York City. Uh, and she was able to sustain a black school. In any case, uh, speeding up to this building, the old state house, uh, Andrew Judson, who lived across the street from her, was someone who opposed this school vehemently. He was an initial supporter when it was for white women. But once it became an institution for black women, he was literally its chief prosecutor. And he was also a state representative. And he came to this old state house and persuaded the majority of legislators here to pass something called the Black Law. The Black Law prohibited the education of black students who came to Connecticut from other states, unless you had permission from the local town authorities, and that was not going to happen in the town of Canterbury. That law passed here uh, in 1833 and was celebrated in the town of Canterbury. Uh, after it passed, the school continued. Prudence Crandall was arrested under the authority of that law. She was put in the Canterbury jail overnight, and this created a national sensation. Her story uh, was reported in every, virtually every state and many, many newspapers throughout the country. She became the critical and most important cause of the abolitionist, the anti-slavery anti movement at that time. She had allies who helped her. She had a, a legal defense that was paid for by a wealthy merchant in New York, Arthur Tappan, uh, some of the best attorneys. Uh, William Ellsworth, Calvin Goddard, and Henry Strong represented her. Uh, they represented her at the trial court level in Brooklyn, where she was initially acquitted with a hung jury. She was tried a second time and convicted, largely because just, uh, justice and judge, because he was served on both the Supreme Court and the, uh, the lower court, David Daggett, 
uh, gave a lengthy discussion talking about how the, the black law was, in his view, constitutional and blacks were not citizens. And that was appealed then to the state Supreme Court where her attorneys gave historic arguments talking about how Article IV of the Constitution provided blacks with the protections that all citizens had, all of the privileges and immunities granted to a citizen in one state must be upheld if that citizen is in another state. And Daggett said, well, that's all very well and good, but free blacks are not citizens, so it does not apply. And when that was appealed to the state Supreme Court, Daggett, unbelievably, who was also a member of the Supreme Court, decided that he would be a member of those justices who would hear his own appeal. He would, he would hear as to the, the case as to whether his own decision at the lower court was the correct, whether his order and instruction to the jury was correct. Not surprisingly, he thought it was correct. And he was Chief Justice, and he cowed the other justices to do what they did not want to do, because we found out many years later that the three other justices wanted to overrule the black law on the grounds of unconstitutionality, but they were afraid to do that. One justice, Justice Williams, no relation, uh, found a technicality in the complaint and said, ah, we can dismiss this case, overrule the lower court's judgment, uh, and at the same time not rule on the merits and not embarrass our esteemed friend, the Chief Justice. So I, I went back to the old State House, uh, not the old State House, but the uh, State Supreme Court Library, looked at the original pleadings, and I did not find the technicality. I do not believe the technicality exists. The court either stretched as far as you can stretch uh, to find a technicality, or they simply invented it. And as a result, folks on both sides, Prudence Crandall's supporters and her opponents were frustrated. She continued her school, and people in town took matters into their own hands. And on September 9th, 1833, at midnight, a group of men gathered outside her school with iron bars and wooden clubs and smashed virtually all of the windows of her school. An alarm was sounded throughout the, the school. People came running outside. Uh, the, the black women students were sobbing. No one else in the town responded, as they would have if people had come out shouting if there had been a fire uh, or some other uh, uh, tragedy. And that was the end of Prudence Crandall's school. Prudence Crandall later moved uh, to Illinois. She lived out the end of her life in Kansas. She continued to teach young children wherever she could. Um, and she was a strong supporter of women's rights uh, to the end. Her case, I want to tell you just a, briefly about her, her legacy. Uh, and her, her case of Crandall v. State was cited for all the wrong reasons in the infamous case of Dred Scott uh, versus Sanford in 1857. This was the case where the Supreme Court decided that they would take on the issue of slavery and make a decision once and for all as to slavery in the United States, and they would decide it in favor of slavery. And they cited David Daggett's instructions to the jury that blacks were not citizens as part of the reasoning uh, for its holding. And the arguments of her attorneys were used about 100 years later when Thurgood Marshall cited William Ellsworth's arguments to the state Supreme Court in Connecticut in the case of Brown versus Board of Education. And that was a critical moment in our history because when that case was first argued, an informal poll of the US Supreme Court justices showed that by a margin of five to four, the justices were unwilling to strike down segregation. They were unwilling to strike down the case of Plessy v. Ferguson that said, separate but equal is okay. The Chief Justice Frederick Vinson died of a heart attack. Uh, President Eisenhower appointed Earl Warren, Republican Governor of California, to be the Chief Justice. He had served as Attorney General and as a state's attorney. He had never served as a judge in any court. And now Earl Warren was Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court. And he came in 
They re-argued the case. They polled the justices. Now there was a 5-4 majority in favor of overruling uh, segregation. He reached out skillfully to the other four justices, one by one, lining them up for a unanimous decision. But they had to base, this, they had to base their decision on constitutional law. And they based it on the 14th Amendment. And by basing it on the Fourth Amendment, 14th Amendment, they called in historical experts, including Howard J. Graham. Howard J. Graham had written law review articles about the origins of the 14th Amendment. And what did Howard J. Graham say? He said the origins of the 14th Amendment can be found in the case of Crandall versus State, where William Ellsworth had argued that the Article 4 of the Constitution, providing that all citizens are entitled to the same privileges and immunities, regardless of what state they've came from, that that must apply to all citizens. And the 14th Amendment said everyone born in this country is a citizen. He took away the argument of David Daggett. And when Earl Warren announced the decision of the Supreme Court, he said, we cannot turn the clock back to 1868 when the 14th of Amendment was adopted. He said that it protects all citizens and segregation cannot stand. So the arguments that Prudence Crandall's attorneys made in 1833 and 1834 were cited again for the wrong reasons in Dred Scott, uh, which helped precipitate the Civil War. Yet Thurgood Marshall, his attorneys, and the historians he brought in to research that case revived those arguments, which were then presented in the brief to the U.S. Supreme Court as to the 14th Amendment. And, the four, and because of that, the Supreme Court struck down segregation. So Prudence Crandall's legacy lives on today. And in the United States, we still grapple with the issue of equality, whether it's gay and lesbian rights, whether it is the ongoing issue of gender equality, and many other issues. So as a nation, we continue to evolve, and we continue to be able to look back at the vision and foresight and courage of Prudence Crandall and her allies. Thank you. If anyone has questions, um, you could raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you so that you can ask. Um, we do have a very skillful mic handler today, so uh, just let me know, waves enough that I can see you. Um, Don, I want to ask you about um, the fact that so many people know Prudence Crandall's story, at least here in Connecticut. She's our state heroine. And yet, in all the times that I've heard her story, until I read your book, I didn't make the connections to those very important cases. Why has that been sort of lost in the history? Well, I think we focused on her story uh, as to you know, what happened at the school. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's, that's the Connecticut part of her history. She then moves to Illinois. She moved. Uh, to Kansas, uh, but you know, when I started finding these law review articles by Howard J. Graham, when I started digging in to what happened at Brown v. Board of Education, uh, it was electrifying, uh, and I was finding things that I had not read before in any account of Prudence Crandall. It's actually sure. Sure. It's actually uh, one of the reasons why I decided to write a book, a book about her legacy. Uh, because I realized at that point that um, there were some very, very important things that needed to be told about Prudence Crandall. Mm -hmm. um, actually, uh, uh, some people do know this, the state legislature eventually tried to make amends with Prudence Crandall when they discovered that she was living in near poverty out in Kansas. Tell us a little bit about that. You know, that's, that's a fascinating story because the legislature was no longer meeting in this building, the old state house. We were over at the, the new Capitol, new then. Uh, this was 1886. And uh, some folks decided that, or they, they had read about recent accounts of her living in Elk Falls, Kansas, uh, and living practically in poverty uh, on a relatively poor uh, prairie farm where she uh, and her brother Hezekiah struggled to, uh, to make ends meet. And they thought, you know, the state of Connecticut really owes Prudence Crandall uh, something after passing the black law that crushed her school. And uh, so there were 
public hearings that were held. People came and testified in favor. What a great idea. The Hartford Current published articles, again, saying absolutely Prudence Crandall deserves this $500 a year pension. Uh, and then it came before the legislature. They held one hearing. They put it off to a second hearing. Um, and then the particular matter that, that uh, the particular bill that had been proposed, they recommitted it which is a, a technical way of killing it. And uh, so people wondered, why did the legislature refuse to, to act to help Prudence Crandall? And there were an, a number of, of explanations that were offered. Uh, some folks felt that it was the town of Canterbury that had wronged her, not the state of Connecticut. Uh, other folks felt that you know if, if she was going to uh, be rewarded in some way or if this problem was going to be addressed, that should have been a long time ago. The statute of limitations has run. Uh, so they're trying to find technical reasons. But I believe that there were a fair number of folks who just wanted to bury this controversial past, uh, a time when the state of Connecticut, its legislature, and its courts failed Prudence Crandall and failed the cause of equality and justice. Yeah. Um, she eventually did get the pension. <laughs> she did. She did. The, the media exploded in outrage uh, when the legislature, this happens occasionally, <laughs> uh, even today, uh, when the legislature does something that folks disagree with, they exploded in outrage, uh, not only in Connecticut, but throughout the country. Again, her cause became a national cause. Uh, and legislators uh, are sometimes influenced by public opinion. Uh, and so they decided to take up her cause again. And the, uh, there had been an initial request for $500 for a pension. I think they decided on $400 as a way of slapping back at the Hartford Current, uh, which was pushing that idea very hard. But one once that was taken up on the floor of the House and the Senate, uh, if there was any resentment on the part of legislators, that melted away and it passed overwhelmingly. Well, I have to say that the book is um, really going to be known, I think, as the most authoritative retelling of her story. Um, and it's a lot of research that goes into it. There are, I don't know, 25 pages of footnotes and, and things. It's just an amazing book. Um, does anybody have any questions about the book? Right here. Well, OK. It, it said. Um, First, I want to thank you for your leadership. Um, I don't necessarily agree with everything that the legislature has done, but you have been a powerful leader, and your leadership will be missed in the state of Connecticut. Having said that, I think most of your colleagues are retiring this year. Do you see a major impact with the fact that Mr. Kefaro is also retiring and Mr. McKinney is running uh, for governor? Um, it, within a primary, do you see an impact or do you see your le uh, lesser known colleagues stepping up and continuing the fight? There's no way that my lesser known colleagues will be able to step up and continue the fight. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Change is, is good. It's what our country has been built on in terms of our legislative and representative democracy. Uh, when I was first elected, uh, in a special election in January of 1993. I was coming in at a time that those who were elected in the 19, 1992 election uh, also uh, made up a, a significant proportion of the legislature. There was a, it was a change election, and a number of folks had decided not to run again. Uh, this year, there are a number of folks who are not running again, not quite as many as back in the 1992 cycle who decided uh, to move on to other challenges. Uh, but absolutely, we have, we have excellent uh, senators and representatives uh, who will continue to do a very good job for our state. That has been our history. That's been our tradition. Don, how is the legislature different today than it was when you first were elected? Uh, in many different ways. Uh, you know, when I was first elected, uh, cell phones were rare. Uh, there wasn't much of an internet uh, to speak of, and you certainly didn't get your news on the internet. Uh, the main sources of news were still uh, the newspaper, radio, and television. Uh, so there wasn't a 24-7 news cycle. Um, we did not have uh, campaign finance reform. We did not have public financing. Uh, so lobbyists and special interest dollars played a much larger role in political campaigns. Uh, so there have been many different changes, some of which have been fundamental and some of which we may not have even recognized since they happened so fast, like dependence on smartphones and texting and uh, getting updates, not 
tomorrow morning when we read the paper, but now as you pull out your laptop or your, or your smartphone. The, the public financing, I think, has uh, been a, a, a great benefit uh, for the state. Uh, no system is go going to be perfect, uh, but it has done a lot to get the special interest money out of our political system. What about the tenor uh, of the uh, House and Senate? How has it changed over the years? You know, thankfully, uh, we don't have gridlock in the state of Connecticut like uh, we see in Washington, D.C. And I think some people might say the tenor has changed uh, somewhat. Perhaps it, it, at times, is more partisan. I'm not really sure about that. I, I in reading about the times of the 1830s, the times uh, during the Civil War, uh, we have had times in our country long before uh, CTN and before the 24-7 news cycle where uh, the partisanship was great and the issues that divided us were much deeper. Uh, I think of uh, uh, Senator uh, Sumner of Massachusetts uh, who gave a speech on the floor of the Senate condemning the expansion of slavery into Kansas. And then a colleague of his on the other side of the aisle from the South uh, uh, confronting him in his office and beating him severely with a gold-topped cane to the point where uh, he was bleeding from the head uh, and did not recover for a series of years. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a stormy, uh, incredible time in our history. We, we don't see anything like that, not even wa in Washington, D.C., uh, let alone here in the state of Connecticut. So the tenor has changed. Uh, the way that, that we are covered has changed. Uh, but, but in Connecticut, I'm, I'm proud that we have, uh, on most occasions, retained uh, civility and the ability uh, to work together. I think there's a question right over here. Getting back to Prudence Crandall, I'd like to know a little bit more about the attorneys who represented her, uh, Williams Ellsworth. Um, what inspired them to take the courageous stand they did, and, and specifically, how did they come up with the innovative legal argument that had such a, le such a legacy for us? The Ellsworth family uh, is an incredibly uh, historic and important family in our, our history. Uh, William Ellsworth's father, Oliver Ellsworth, was uh, a Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court appointed by George Washington. He was one of the authors of the Constitution. William Ellsworth uh, was, at different times, uh, a congressman. Uh, he was governor of the state of Connecticut. He later served as a justice on the Connecticut uh, Supreme Court. When he was a congressman in Washington, D.C., and this was before the Prudence Crandall case, uh, I found this very instructive. At a time when a number of the southern states were acting to expel Indian tribes and to take their land, just simply grab their land, uh, there was a debate in Congress as to whether this should be prohibited or not. And William Ellsworth, William Ellsworth was one of the few uh, representatives who stood up at that time to say that was wrong. It was wrong, it was wrong as a matter of law, but it was also morally wrong uh, to expel uh, these indigenous peoples uh, from their land and to simply uh, take that from them. So I think uh, that, that gives you some insight as to William Ellsworth's character uh, and then his ability to work with his colleagues, Calvin Goddard, also an extraordinary uh, man, and, and Henry Strong, uh, to fashion arguments that had never been put down on paper before in American history. Crandall versus State uh, was the first full-throated civil rights ca case in the history of America, and it was decided here in the state of Connecticut. Yes, and then we'll come back over here. since Prudence Crandall's day. It's been 60 years since Brown versus Board of Education. Here we are, and we're still trying to realize the promise of Chef versus O'Neill. So does Connecticut need another Prudence Crandall? It's a, very, it's a mixed legacy. Uh, in Brown versus Board of Education, this country moved fundamentally in a different and better direction. Yet at the same time, uh, if you go into many urban schools in the state uh, of Connecticut, but also throughout this country, uh, you will find that the, the segregation, uh, not as a matter of law, 
but simply as social practice, is still very much in force and effect. Uh, and there are some who would say that the goals in Brown have more or less been abandoned, and that in a de facto way, we're back to Plessy v. Ferguson, uh, separate but equal. And so, so absolutely, it, it's a mixed bag in terms of our legacy, particularly in education, uh, since Brown. Another question over here. Can you tell us about the, the black laws were repealed in five years later in 1838. Can you tell us about what sort of that process and what happened there? Yes. Um, the state of Connecticut uh, passed the black law in 1833. Uh, after that time, uh, and particularly after uh, Prudence Crandall School was violently closed by the attack of anonymous townspeople, uh, folks began to reflect in this state and in others. Uh, Theodore Dwight Weld uh, was an abolitionist who was born in Hampton, Connecticut. He went out to uh, Ohio and uh, created institutions uh, for uh, educate, educating black citizens. Uh, he participated in something called the Lane Debates, which opposed slavery. When he came back to Connecticut, he talked to a state senator, Philip Pearl. Philip Pearl had headed the committee, which issued a report endorsing passage of the black law. And uh, Theodore Dwight Weld uh, encouraged uh, Philip Pearl to rethink this. And because of the passage of the five years and the, the reflection on the part of many uh, who at that point believed that they had been swept up in a, in a hysteria at the time that, that passed the black law, Philip Pearl decided that he personally uh, would help in the repeal effort and sponsor the legislation necessary uh, to repeal the black law. I want to get back to um, uh, your legislative career, if we can. And um, as you look back now, and I'm assuming you're probably going to be doing some more reflection in the next few days, but I assume you already have done some. What would you say was your biggest accomplishment as a legislator, and what was your biggest disappointment? You know, biggest accomplishment, there are a couple different things that come to mind. But I, if you had asked me to pick one, it would be in helping to guide the legislative response to the uh, incredible and unimaginable tragedy uh, at the Sandy Hook Elementary School. Um, the, the, it, it could have torn the legislature apart in a number of different ways, and that tragedy called out uh, for a response. And we heard from so many different uh, parents of those who lost their children, uh, who lost uh, uh, their, their friends, their family, their colleagues, the teachers, uh, and the principal of the school. And uh, uh, I reached out to my friend and colleague, uh, John McKinney, who was a Republican Senate leader who had gone through a lot because this tragedy occurred in his district and uh, said, you know, uh, regardless of what the outcome is, we ought to try to do this in a bipartisan way. Um, and we talked with the speaker, the speaker talked with the uh, uh, Republican House leader, and we agreed to do something that had never been done uh, on this type of issue uh, in, in our country, as far as I'm, I know, and that is to try to find a bipartisan solution. Uh, and we held many public hearings, had many different meetings, had input from, from all sides, uh, and in the end, were able to pass uh, the strongest law, not only in terms of gun violence prevention, but also in terms of strengthening mental health, strengthening school security. And at the end of the day, this legislation passed with the support of not only Democratic leaders, uh, but Republican leaders. Not only Democratic rank and file, but Republican rank and file. Not unanimous by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but this is the first and only time that I can think of in our country uh, where, certainly in recent years, Democrats and Republicans have been able to come together in a substantive way on perhaps one of the most divisive issues, uh, toxic issues in our politics. I would like to think that that is a model not only for those issues, uh, but for many of the other important issues that we face in Washington and elsewhere. As Mr. McKinney goes forward with his um, bid to become governor, is that going to come back to bite him? 
I, I have no idea, but I just, uh, I hope that across the board, whether it's as folks consider Senator McKinney or they consider uh, other legislators, that they take a look at what we were able to do and the fact that we did listen to all points of view and the fact that we did work together as Democrats and Republicans. Uh, so that, that certainly is, is one issue I can think of. I, you know, on a, on a different note, the Community Investment Act, mm -hmm. uh, where I worked with some of my colleagues to provide uh, resources to help preserve historical assets like the old state house mm -hmm. here, to help preserve uh, farmland and open space, to help create affordable housing. Uh, that's something that continues on and has touched virtually every town in our state. How about a disappointment? <laughs> um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm an optimist uh, by nature, and uh, I've been asked this question before, and uh, uh, you know, I, I, there, there is no one outstanding disappointment, uh, in part because as president of the Senate, if you don't get it the first year, to get, you get to come back and try again <laughs> the second year. <laughs> that kind of works out. Uh, so, so for the most part, you know, whether it was back in 2005, uh, pursuing something that wasn't altogether popular at the time, unbelievably, uh, being concerned about the health of children and the diet of children in our schools, uh, and, and passing a law that didn't make it the first time, and then we came back the second year and we were able to pass it. Uh, I've had the opportunity uh, to come back at issues like that, work with colleagues, and then uh, usually get it across the goal line. We have a question right over there. Uh, Senator, first of all, thank you very much in that uh, leadership that you showed during the Sandy Hook aftermath for defending, in the long run, uh, the rights of the press and the availability of information to the press. I thought that was a very courageous stand on your part to stand up to uh, some of those who wanted to limit the freedoms of the press in dealing with these tragedies. Bringing both the subject of Prudence Crandall as well as your leadership at the Senate back to a final question from my thoughts at least, would you comment on school choice? There seems to be a continuing debate that we have long, too long defended our public school system and some of the poorest schools, both in terms of outcomes and in terms of resources, at the and yet restricted open school choice, and yet the legislature has encouraged a lot of charter schools and some wonderful uh, investments that we've made in, in opening up the choice of schools. Could you talk about that a bit? Sure. Um, you know, I, uh, I supported uh, the ch school choice and the charter school legislation when we first uh, took a look at that in the 1990s. And at the time, it was talked about as developing schools that would be laboratories of learning where we could find what worked, what didn't work, and then take those lessons back to our public schools. Uh, in the state of Connecticut, over 90% of our students are taught at traditional public schools. And the majority of those public schools are some of the best public schools in the country. And so I believe we need to get back to what the original intent of some of these alternative schools were. Not to, not to simply build a, a never-ending string of additional schools at tremendous expense that at this point in our his history we can't afford, but to be those laboratories of learning so that then we not abandon the schools that provide the education to 90% of our children, but that we take those lessons learned back. Uh, and, and I feel that that, that is, is not only the, the more efficient way uh, to do it, but that then takes us back to the original intent of what this was all about. You know, an interesting quote that I saw from Prudence Crandall uh, when toward the end of her life she was asked, um, you know, how did your black students perform? Did they perform as well as the white students that you taught when you were in Plainfield and you were in Lisbon? And she said something very interesting. She said, the black students that I taught performed just as well as the white students who came from similar backgrounds. And I think there's something to be learned there. The schools in the greatest need in the state of Connecticut are also in the poorest communities in the state of Connecticut. We need to understand that simply imposing top-down solutions rearranging the deck chairs in terms of evaluations and, and technology, et cetera, that's not enough. That's not going to get to the issue that we see today when it's the poorest communities that are in the greatest need in terms of the school and what Prudence Crandall saw 
back in the 1830s. It hasn't changed. Senator, um, you've worked with uh, four different House speakers, um, Moira Lyons, James Amon, Jim, Chris Donovan, and Brendan Sharkey. Could you describe the relationship between the Senate president and the House speaker and how that works? Well, sometimes it's, it's uh, you know, a traffic cop, especially at the end of the, of the session in terms of figuring out how we're going to get the legislation passed uh, that we need to get passed. Uh, my relations with the, the speakers have been good and productive. I think that we've been able to work well together uh, to do the business of the state of Connecticut and more recently in some very tough times. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've enjoyed working uh, with all the speakers. Sometimes there's conflict, you know, within the legislature. Sometimes people will say, gee, you know, it's not Democrats versus Republicans, it's the House against the Senate. <laughs> uh, you hear that in the building. Uh, once in a while, that kind of dynamic rears its head. Uh, but, uh, you know, by and large, uh, I've been able to work very well with speakers. And, you know, the bottom line is, even through these tough times, uh, we've been able to, to take care of the essential business of the state. And you've worked with four governors as well, Weicker, Rowland, Rell, and Malloy. Um, which one was the most fun to work with, and, and which one was the most difficult? <laughs> Well, of course, Governor Malloy has been the most fun to work with in terms of accomplishment uh, and getting things done. It's amazing to me that I've served for 22 years uh, in the state Senate, and only the last four uh, have I been able to serve with a, a Democrat. Uh, so we have uh, done much, achieved much, and I really appreciate uh, Governor Malloy's uh, commitment uh, to moving the state forward. Uh, Governor Weicker uh, was just a character and, and a historical figure. So to be able to begin my legislative career uh, with Governor Weicker as uh, governor, who, where I remembered when I was in high school watching the Watergate hearings, and there he was, Senator Weicker, uh, uh, making a name for himself and Connecticut in that process. Uh, that was inspiring as well. Let me ask you um, one final question, unless anybody else wants to interject something here. Does anybody have a question? All right, then I want to ask you, um, what's next? Thank you, Diane. You know, that's, that's going to be my journey uh, for the next couple of months here. Uh, my background is in law, it's in education, uh, it is in obviously government and in journalism. And uh, I'm having a lot of fun uh, with this book, uh, Prudence Crandall's Legacy. And uh, I'm on a mini book tour this week. Uh, and I don't know, I might uh, try my hand at uh, writing something if I can... Uh, run that idea by my wife first, because uh, <laughs> this, this, this took years. It was, sure. it was a, a hobby that uh, took uh, an investment. But, uh, but I'm looking forward to the next challenges. Well, we're always looking for another good journalist in this state, so uh, <laughs> maybe CTN can make space for you. <laughs> thank you, <Diane. laughs> Thank you so much, and thank you for all your service and your leadership over the years. Thank you so much, and thank you everybody for coming today. We do have Senator Williams' book for sale in the gift shop across the hallway, and I believe you'll be able to stay for a few minutes and sign some for us, so thank you again for coming. You can stay as long as Derek says. Okay. <laughs>